different professional societies, such as the Philippine Society for Microbiology Incorporated, the Fish Sigma Biological Sciences Honor Society, and the Philippine Psychological Society Incorporated, a contributing member of the American Society for Microbiology, and a registered microbiologist since 2013 by the Philippine Academy of Microbiology. He authored and co-authored 46 peer-reviewed publications since 2012 and was also invited by various local and international organizations for research talks and poster paper presentations. One of his latest research projects was the characterization of a putative antibiotic-producing novel, Streptomyces species, isolated from the soils of Mount Mayon, Philippines, from January 2020 to December 2021, in connection to share his talk on genomic-driven natural products discovery from novel bacteria isolated from extreme environments. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, let us give a virtual to Dr. Hello, uh, good morning to everyone here in the convention, virtual convention. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. Good morning. Paul. Hello, good morning, Professor Vargas. Thank you for the very uh, lengthy and extensive introduction of myself. Uh, I'll just quickly share my slide here. Can everyone see my slide? Yes, sir, it's visible now. Okay, thank you. Uh, so for today's seminar, uh, what I'll be presenting will be uh, three projects uh, that I essentially help uh, fellow Filipino students uh, while I was based in Canada, which is on uh, the genomics-driven natural product discovery uh, of novel bacteria isolated from, I would say, relatively uh, extreme environments. Uh, currently, um, I'm back here in the country after 15 years of being away and uh, taking trainings overseas. I'm currently a science and technolo technology fellow too, uh, essentially um, being a consultant for the Toklas Lunas program, which is the drug and development program of the Philippine Council for Health Research and Development uh, from the bigger umbrella of the Department of Science and Technology. So the talk that I'll be presenting will be limited to three projects. Uh, first project will be uh, focusing on a hypersaline environment, which is also petroleum contaminated. Uh, and this work uh, was done virtually uh, with a PhD student in Algeria and utilizing uh, the paired genomics and metabolomics procedure, we have looked into um, antibiotics like fengicine, which is a bisurfactant, uh, a lipopeptide as well, and see how this uh, tools of omics can actually probe not just the evolutionary relationship of this uh, new strain of bacillus called bacillus velicensis, but also look into secondary bioactive uh, metabolites. Uh, the second project that I'll present will be something more local, um, relevant for the Beagle chapter of ESM. We're in, uh, for two years, we work virtually with uh, UB Los Banos colleagues and look into the antibacterial and anti-colorectal cancer potential of uh, apparently a novel species of actinobacterium. Uh, streptomyces, which we are hoping to name Mayonensis from Mount Mayon in Albay. And the third project will be probing uh, deep sea environments, uh, specifically the Benham Rice Plateau of the Philippine Rice. So this is an, uh, an underwater uh, continental shelf uh, bigger than the combined islands of Luzon, Samar, uh, and Leyte. And here uh, we'll be looking into a targeted metabolomics uh, to probe uh, pigments uh, from this deep sea uh, isolates. In the process, uh, the works that's been, uh, that I'll be presenting today has been published. Uh, you can see here um, on the right panel, uh, the structure of uh, fengicine, which is a lipopeptide. So you will see later that I'll be this 
describing the peptide uh, moiety as well as the lipid component, this lipid uh, tail. Uh, let me see if I can actually make an annotation. I guess not. Uh, the second uh, component will be looking into uh, procedures that identify uh, the bioactivity of uh, certain food extracts of uh, the actinobacterium from Mayon. And lastly, um, correlating uh, biosynthetic gene clusters, which is the genetic mach machinery for the production of these compounds, uh, which are pinkish red uh, molecules uh, that you will see later has uh, application towards textile and fabric uh, diability. But, uh, as well as um, antimicrobial properties. So moving forward, why are we doing this? Well, um, we're currently in the pandemic, but uh, the WHO also um, identified one key uh, concern of, by 2050, which is antimicrobial uh, resistance or antibiotic resistance, which based on uh, extrapolated data, uh, it may actually cause 10 million deaths by 2050. So that is essentially less than 30 years from now. And therefore, there is really a need to uh, work on this uh, global uh, problem. So what exactly is AMR or antimicrobial resistance? Uh, it is also sometimes called antibiotic resistance. Uh, and what antimicrobials are, are essentially uh, substances um, that we use to treat a wide uh, variety of infection uh, from human to animals or even plants. Uh, this kill the microorganism. They can be bacteriostatic or bactericidal. And some of the classical examples, sorry about that, uh, will be your typical penicillin historically that helped during the World, world War II. Uh, you have uh, erythromycin, uh, you have ciprofloxacin in the legs. And these antibiotics, although uh, are not often uh, perceived or exposed to the different uh, organisms, uh, antimicrobial resistance developed due to the evolutionary adaptations of uh, this bacteria, either individually or as a community. Uh, one classical example of this will be in the case of uh, methicillin resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus, aureus, which is uh, commonly present uh, as a normal flora of our skin, of our mucus lining. And such resistance uh, has been rampantly uh, growing or exponentially growing because of three key features. Uh, that would be first, uh, the overuse of antibiotics, the misuse of antibiotics, as well as the utilization of the antibiotics towards different uh, non human systems such as in aqua farming or in agriculture or animal husbandry as shown in, in this slide. Economically, uh, this growing resistance poses a serious risk to public health as well as uh, our overall survival. If you look at the numbers projected by the United Nations, uh, it is expected to contribute to almost 100,000 uh, loss in the planet cross domestic product starting that started in 2014 and will materialize by 2050 if uh, there will be no new antimicrobials that will be developed uh, for the treatment of this uh, multi-drug resistant uh, infections. So how did the United Nations basically sound the alarm is a single phrase, no time to wait. Uh, securing the future from drug-resistant infection requires a consolidated uh, interdisciplinary One Health response that basically look into antimicrobial resistance, not just from the human's perspective, but also uh, agricultural aspect, the environment, as well as uh, animal husbandry. A sustained One Health response for shared vision and goals uh, of scientists, um, the government, uh, and the private industry to basically resist and achieve a sustainable uh, development uh, towards our survival.
So with that, uh, I would like to bring a disjunction. Uh, what are we talking about in terms of antimicrobial resistance and how did WHO classify uh, those that are of concern? Uh, there is this abbreviation called SKP, uh, which stands for the six nosocomial pathogens that are often associated with multi-drug resistance as well as maintain uh, virulence or pathogenicity. Uh, you have E for enterococcus patium. Uh, we, have you heard of the vancomycin resistant uh, enterococcus, which often are uh, associated with diarrheal diseases? Uh, Staphylococcus aureus for S, which is more uh, common uh, in the literature because of its methicillin resistance. Um, you have here the third one, uh, K for Klebsiella pneumoniae, uh, which is, of course, the, uh, one of the agents for pneumonia. Uh, we have recent cases of carbapenem uh, resistant strains. Uh, the fourth one is uh, Acinetobacter baumannii, uh, which is uh, often a hospital acquired infection, but um, there will be cases where uh, American soldiers and troops uh, that came back from Iraq uh, actually carried uh, Acinetobacter baumannii uh, resistant strains or multi-drug multi resistant strains. Uh, the fifth one is Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa, uh, which is uh, a pathogen, often an opportunistic pathogen, often associated at least in North America with cystic fibrosis. And lastly, the group of Enterobacter uh, and slash uh, Enterobacteriaceae, that particular family that includes Salmonella, uh, etc. Uh, to basically contribute to the six groups of uh, critical uh, nosocomial pathogens. So I would like to quote uh, the principal contributor for uh, the identification of those six SKP uh, microorganisms that new antibiotics targeting that particular list uh, will help to reduce uh, deaths due to resistant infections around the world. So. While we're battling this uh, pandemic, this COVID pandemic, uh, the explosion of the omics field uh, can also be utilized uh, not just for gene sequencing to identify evolutionary um, events or uh, uh, mutations, uh, just like the different variants, but also utilize it for mining bioactive secondary metabolites that may have, have antimicrobial properties. Uh, if you look at uh, the groups of prokaryotes as well as eukaryotes, uh, we have here the microorganisms group. Uh, uh, you have here the quorum sensing molecule, uh, homocerine lactone, uh, that a lot of bacteria utilize uh, for uh, communication. Uh, you have here your classical uh, beta-lactam antibiotic that targets the cell wall of bacteria in the case of penicillin. Um, secondary metabolites are also quite abundant in plants. Uh, if you had your coffee this morning, uh, caffeine, which is uh, a molecule um, that stimulates us in, uh, to do our work, is also quite uh, insecticidal. So with the different domains of life, as well as kingdoms, uh, even invertebrates and vertebrates do have uh, bioactive secondary uh, metabolites, like for example, this carminic acid, which is the red pigment isolated from scale insects. Uh, this anthropinone type molecule conjugated with a uh, uh, carbohydrate moiety here has been uh, utilized by the industry to actually create a uh, natural red, which is a dye we use uh, uh, to stain our food with a red color. Um, another molecule that um, that's quite important is this conotoxin, which is initially uh, a venom uh, produced by the pond snail right here, but um, it has application towards uh, pain management and uh, can be uh, developed into a different drug by uh, creating analogs. For vertebrates, you have the cetacepulbin from this colorful uh, Macau parrot, or for humans, we have the estradiol, which is a hormone. So if you look at the repository of uh, 
molecules that's available, um, there are a lot of secondary metabolites that are registered in the dictionary of natural products. Uh, roughly three-fourths or 75% of this are actually of plant origin. But then if you look at how the other groups actually fare in terms of the available genetic resources we have, specifically for NCBI, which is the National Center for Biotechnology and Information, roughly 80 to 85 percent of those available sequences are of bacterial origin. So as a microbiologist, this is essentially a limitless uh, opportunity to actually probe for this bioactive secondary uh, metabolites. Hence, if we can couple uh, this omics field platforms in studying a strain or an environment, unique environment, or leverage them for, let's say, in the case of the Philippines, which is a biodiversity hotspot, then we have a chance to identify interesting BGCs or uh, biosynthetic gene clusters. Uh, to isolate natural products that may not necessarily be the A-all and B-all for the new uh, super drug, but it can be a, a basis for uh, drug development and analog production. Uh, there's a lot of big data associated with this, and mining them um, is a skill that often, uh, as our uh, first speaker, Dr. Legado, mentioned, retooling and combining different fields uh, will actually help uh, uh, develop uh, new streams of research. Uh, so in the lab that I came from, uh, in the University of Alberta, we utilize uh, genomics and bioinformatics tools uh, for sequencing molecules, uh, sequencing the DNA of the organism, uh, identify, of course, the classical genotype and phenotype, uh, of the organism uh, and utilize computational tools to establish not just the evolutionary phylogenetic uh, relationship from the basic uh, standpoint, but also uh, into the applied uh, sphere of secondary met metabolite uh, prediction. To do so, we coupled this uh, genomics more on the biological field with chemistry by utilizing proteomics and metabolomics tools. Uh, here, we often use uh, HPLC, uh, Maldi-Toff uh, mass spectrometry, as well as NMR or nuclear magnetic resonance to elucidate uh, and correlate uh, the molecules, especially if they're novel, uh, with the genetic sequences. That brings me to the first project that uh, uh, I worked on uh, a couple of years back, uh, four years ago, uh, which is a uh, collaborative work with uh, then student uh, Mohamed Bass uh, from Algeria, who's part of the Agri Agricultural Research Center of the country, where in uh, we pro uh, Hyper Salem Lake in his country. Uh, so here's the map of Algeria uh, in Africa. And there are certain landlocked uh, lakes within the region. And this is uh, the picture of the lake that was being sampled uh, in Ain Baida. Uh, it's a hypersaline lake uh, with salinity ranging from 5 to 27 percent, depending upon the season, whether it's a rainy or trout season. And if you compare the salinity range, it's actually higher than seawater at 3.5 percent. Uh, Petroleum mining is an industry in that region, and hence uh, a lot of these lakes are often contaminated with uh, petroleum or oil. If we then compare how, from a regular perspective, how this hypersaline hyper environment fared with, let's say, our drinking water, which is at zero parts per thousand, then it's actually at the top area, these briny lakes. Uh, mangrove areas or estuarine regions are often half uh, parts per thousand, half percent. And then you have the ocean at uh, 30 parts per thousand. And this uh, hypersaline lakes are at 50 percent or 50 parts per thousand. Therefore, this so-called extreme environment, uh, from my experience, is a good uh, opportunity to probe and isolate microorganisms and look for the next uh, drug or drug candidate. 
So the approach that uh, we employ uh, is a pair genomics and metabolomics, often targeted. Uh, and of course, to establish this, or at least be convinced that it's uh, good to pursue, uh, we look for the biological activity first by sort of a classical microbiological phenotype characterization. And of course, uh, there is a routine isolate characterization uh, involving biochemical and microbiological procedures, as well as the target phenotype, which in, in our case initially is an oil degradation absorption phenotype. To do so, uh, we employed and look for the drops collab collapse method, i.e. how uh, the molecules or the oil can be uh, dissolved or how it can be mixed in, uh, in an aqueous uh, solution, like in the emulsification assay. And what we have seen thus far is that uh, the organisms that we have tested, the bacillus species, uh, can reach up to 80% bisurfactant or emulsification index, which is a good indication that uh, it can be utilized for uh, oil bioremediation, at least in the region of Algeria. This were coupled, as I have said, with uh, um, phenotype or morphological characterization. What you're seeing right now are two electron micrographs, uh, a scanning electron micrograph at the top of the bacterium. It, some of this uh, seemingly lipid-like uh, vesicles, uh, which are actually attracted into the cell of the organism. So this is an environmental scanning electron micrograph that I have done, and um, which means that there's no chemical uh, perturbations prior to the electron micrograph uh, photo taking. Also, at the same time, when you look into the cross section of the organism, uh, it has this uh, inclusion bodies, uh, PB, uh, that is actually, uh, I, I guess, hypothesized to be uh, an oil or rather a bioplastic uh, precursor uh, storing mechanism uh, known as polyhydroxyalkanoate uh, bodies. So. With, with this sort of basic classical microbiology uh, data, uh, we now have a confidence to do the subsequent genomics and uh, metabolomics work because now we have an acemic culture that's a requirement so that you can actually have uh, a good uh, indicator of your genome or rather purity of the genome, uh, an interesting phenotype, which is uh, the biosurfactant ability, and it's from an extreme environment, giving you a higher chance that maybe it's a novel species or a novel genus of bacterium uh, after all. So let's look first on the one of the pair, the genomics pair. Uh, so here uh, we sequence the genome using an Illumina platform and in the process perform comparative genomics. So this is uh, what you are, what you're seeing right now is a uh, series of concentric circles, which are essentially a comparison of uh, the organism that we're looking at, Bacillus amyloliquefaciens, which is uh, here at the outermost region. And then as you go into the interior of this so-called circular chart, uh, uh, you will see the other type strain species and comparing them from the genetic uh, point the view. And for the most part, you can see that a lot of the red regions are actually more than 90% identical. So that's a good indicator that at least the organization of this, okay, my mouse, yeah, okay, uh, an indication that you are on the right sort of identity, identity for the organism. We then created the whole genome phylogenetic tree uh, based on the available uh, type strain species. And what we have found is that there is a need to actually reclassify a lot of the identified bacillus amyloliquefaciens subspecies plantarum deposited in the NCBI database uh, and propose a different uh, species epithet, which is bacillus belizensis. And this is where the isolate from Algeria actually clustered. Interesting enough is that uh, the subspecies amyloliquefaciens was also uh, seemingly requiring reclassification. For example, this Bacillus subtilis uh, American type strain culture collection 
uh, is actually misidentified. So this is one of the, the, the strength of genomics nowadays because you can actually reclassify and correct uh, species name in, in the databases. Apart from that, the availability of the genome also made us to look into the genetic uh, determinants for the biosurfactant uh, molecule, which was observed in the phenotype. Uh, and here we identified the complete uh, cluster for uh, this fen operon, the fen gene operon, a five-member gene operon. And in the process, uh, we can now look into the other half of our approach, which is metabolomics, now that we can see the genetic blueprint for the biosurfactant production. With such presumptive evidence, uh, the correlation between the phenotype and genotype can then be probed using metabolomics. So this is sort of an abridged version of the procedure that we actually do in the lab. Uh, it's a three-stage purification uh, of the supernatant, uh, your classically fermented uh, Bacillus pelicensis culture, uh, which then utilize a hydrophobic type of a resin called amberlite. And in this column, it will be subjected in an increasing level of alcohol. And in the process, the fractions that's being separated will undergo a canonical uh, bioassay procedure, whether it's a spot on lawn or a disc diffusion assay. So these are the two sort of uh, organisms we use in the lab. We have the gram-positive lactobacilli carnobacterium divergence. Uh, as well as uh, Salmonella and Terica representing the gram negative. And as you can see in those zones of clearing, uh, the different crude extracts or fractionated extracts are actually being separated based on its activity. Hence, for this purpose, we're actually using an activity guided fractionation uh, meta targeted metabolomics. This procedure will undergo bioassay too, which uh, after the detection of, let's say, the 80% fraction, isopropanol fraction, you can then further separate this using a C18 cartridge uh, column, which is another hydrophobic type of fractionation procedure, uh, but mainly targeting the lipid uh, moiety of the fengicin molecule. Last but not the least, uh, the last procedure uh, entails an extensive HPLC purification so that we can identify and hopefully elucidate the structure of the molecules using further uh, chemistry, analytical chemistry tools. Mm -hmm. To do so, uh, we perform a tandem mass spectrometry of the pengesine uh, molecules. And here you can see a commercial pengesine with uh, the peaks uh, presented here. And for the crude extracts and fractions that we have extracted, we can now see how the fragmentation of this peptide uh, molecule will be a signature relative to the length of the um, lipid or the aliphatic side chain. So the first one is tangesin A with a C14 tail, meaning there are, there are 14 carbon in, in that uh, aliphatic side chain. And you can see from this fragmentation profile, together with another analog of fengesin A, one can actually do sort of a reverse engineering as to how the fragments, once the tandem mass spec MSMS will cut the amide bond of the different amino acid. These signatures will actually be a signature of an, of an amino acid and therefore you can reconstruct the molecule itself. Last but not the least, there is another analog, Fengesin B, with a C14 tail. And the only difference is that this alanine moiety right here was substituted with a valine uh, residue to create Fengesin. From here, uh, we were able to identify four Fengesin analogs, including a C16, 15, and 14 for Fengesin A as well as uh, C15 for fengesine D. So with that, how does this fengesine fit into the escape and AMR story? Well, uh, fengesine A, being a lipopeptide of the non-ribosomal peptide synthase cluster, uh, has a 
effectivity or at least activity against staph aureus, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And in fact, in the same year that we published our work, uh, the group of Otto uh, in Germany actually utilized uh, bacillus strains that produce pangesin A as a probiotic, and they were able to decode that the pathogen uh, Staph aureus is actually mitigated or killed via the action of pangesin on a specific molecule called RC and the cascade by which pangesin block this phosphorylation step will then uh, downregulate uh, toxin production in Staph aureus and therefore can be killed in, let's say, a methicillin resistant type of infection. So with that, uh, I'll be moving on to project number two, which is uh, the novel bioactive isolate, uh, Streptomyces myomensis, which is the work that I collaborated with uh, Professor Cristel Oliveros from the University of the Philippines in Las Panas and see how the antibacterial and anti-cancer potential of this isolate may actually drive drug discovery or rather uh, drug development. So again, um, the approach that I'll be presenting in the three sort of projects will be a paired uh, genomics and, uh, and activity-guided uh, metabolomics. Uh, we established the genome of this large uh, GC or guanine cytosine rich uh, actinobacterium. So there's a little bit of um, challenges in terms of sequencing the entire genome. But we then focus more on the SKP as well, uh, a Vibrio cholera pandemic strain, to look into the suitability of the extracts in actually creating or rather uh, killing these uh, bugs. Furthermore, with the availability of the genomes, we then look into uh, certain gene clusters, four of which are actually already known. Uh, two of the antibiotics are called al alpha flavanone right here, a bicyclic ketone molecule. Uh, and you have here uh, germicidin, uh, which is also detected in the genome uh, with the clusters. Again, uh, we look into uh, isolating and phenol of the isolate uh, of the cultures, uh, this is where samples, soil samples were collected. Those were then uh, characterized uh, medium or uh, selected medium. In this case, we utilize the international streptomyelin medium, and of course, uh, perform as phylogenetic. Uh, analysis. And in the process, we were able to identify 30 distinct actinomycid species from um, the soil samples we collected from uh, essentially uh, three uh, zonal elevation, 500, 1,000 uh, meters above sea level. But for the purposes of this talk, I'll be focusing only on one strain, which is A108. Uh, A108 is our focus, and we subject that to the same pipeline um, for metabolomics, as I have mentioned earlier, and essentially use a different set of uh, test organism, uh, focusing mainly on SKA members, as well as Vibrio cholera, which is a, a pandemic strain at the moment. So how does the crude extract fit into the SCAFE and the antimicrobial resistance picture? Uh, with the candidate antibiotics, uh, we were able to at least uh, sorry about that, um, establish uh, activity uh, towards uh, four members of the SCAFE group. But what's striking, at least, or maybe this is actually uh, expected is that actinobacteria being a prolific secondary metabolite producer, we have identified an arsenal of putative antibiotics, uh, 48 of which, uh, if you compare that with the classical bacillus, the first one that I uh, presented, they have roughly five to maybe at most 10 uh, putative antibiotics. So as such, you can see here the homology on the last column that a lot of this 
could actually be novel and new, considering that this was isolated from an extreme environment, from the soils, of, from the volcanic soils of Mayuan. And at the same time, it's unique probably in the country. And that is somehow being answered uh, also later on by our genomics data. But on the side, apart from the antimicrobial activity, we went also to look into whether it has activity against uh, human cell lines, specifically cancer cell lines. So using uh, a specific assay, a titer assay, this medium throughput feature was able to identify the concentration that will actually inhibit uh, the proliferation of uh, colorectal cancer cell line. Here is coupled with a uh, confocal microscopy assay. You can see that the treated cells can no longer actually divide and remain spherical, while the non-treated control after an hour started to actually form the spindle-like uh, shapes, which is an indicator that uh, it's actually dividing after being uh, processed. We then compare the values of our concentration uh, to identify the IC50 with doxorubicin, which is the, um, the standard uh, drug utilized for this type of work. And although the value we found is 21.54, which is extremely high, meaning it's not as effective as the purified doxorubicin, kindly take note that this is an ethyl acetate extract and it's a mixture uh, of the different metabolites of this streptomyces myonensis. So this is something that uh, we are going to probe uh, in the future and see which is the actual molecule responsible for uh, the anticholorectal property. On this side, uh, we are quite happy that when we actually look more into uh, streptomyces A108 from myon, apparently it seems that we have data to support that we have discovered a new species, and this is based on the uh, genomic evidences. When we look into the 16S rRNA3 or the multi local sequence typing 3, you can see here that uh, the streptomyces of concern actually did not specifically uh, align or cluster with only one group. In fact, uh, based on the multi sequence local uh, typing, it, the closest relative is an olive isolate, streptomyces olivaceous. If you look at the gold standard now for genomics and species cutoff of bacteria, the cutoff is 95%, meaning if the value of your aligned nucleotide uh, sequences are actually 95% and above, then the organism in question is of the same species. Otherwise, anything below that cutoff is considered a new species. And in the case of this myon isolate, it's actually 93.03 with the closest type string, at least in the literature. We therefore have, in the future, will propose streptomyces myonensis as the species epithet in honor for where it was isolated. Uh, the third project that I'll be presenting will be more on the deep sea environment, and this is actually spearheaded by uh, then student Christopher Batbatan. So, the, the works that we work on actually were all students. We are all sort of PhD students, and we are collaborating while well. we are from different regions or even country at the time. Uh, here, uh, we hunted for microbial pigments from the Benham Rice Seamount. Uh, parts of the Philippine rice. This is the shallowest portion. We can actually take samples. And this expedition happened in 2016 until we started probing this in 2020. The isolates were basically collected by technical divers uh, when they went down roughly 50 to 60 meters. So that requires a special license. And in the process, we were able to see roughly 300 pigmented isolates and for the purpose of this talk i'll be focusing only with uh, with this five or even four of them and they're very colorful actually so again we have this classical phenotyping and genotyping work uh, for one of the isolate it clustered with pseudo alteromonas rubra a group of proteobacteria uh, that is actually known for their pigments so this phylogenetic group that you see right now uh they're color coded for the type of pigment that they from the orange uh, zeaxanthin to the red pigments from uh, the isolate we found in Benham rice. We have the yellow isolates and, and the blue. 
interesting enough is that they're also a plate that actually uh, are non-pigmented, so seemingly uh, not pigment involved at different points in the evolutionary tree uh, or events for this particular genus. Second isolate that we will be discussing is on Meridiani Maribacher flavus, which is a flavor bacterium, uh, a bright yellow, lemon yellow uh, isolate, uh, which is actually the fourth isolate, at least to date, that I'm aware of that is uh, 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 deposited in the databases. Uh, so this clusters with uh, the type strain Meridiani Maribacher flavus. And the last two isolates, uh, the pink and the brown isolates, actually are part of the same uh, genus, Cytobacillus. Uh, one clusters with uh, Cytobacillus infantis, uh, while the other one clusters with uh, Cytobacillus oceanus diminis. So with this in mind, uh, and uh, a cynic isolate also coming from, I guess, the first exploration of this kind of environment, one may argue may not necessarily be extreme, but not everyone can actually go there. So we're quite lucky to actually have an access to the samples. We were able to establish their genomes. Uh, so this data are not yet published. We're in the process of writing the manuscript. Uh, but we have at least probed where could be the carotenoid or the pink pigment, uh, pigmented isolate, or the seasantine yellow pigment, or the isorinaritin pigment. So these are the homology of the different uh, biosynthetic clusters uh, with the organism. So with this in mind, we can now move on to the latter half of our paired approach, which is metabolomics. So using a procedure to extract the pigments, uh, either by acetone or hexane, we're able to focus on one of the strains, mainly because one phenotype that we are after, which is the textile or liability potential. So this one is quite good. Using a, a solid scaffold, in this case a cotton ball, uh, you can actually induce the pigment to actually produce quite well, maybe as a function of carbon sensing. Just quickly checking, I still have 10 minutes right here. Um, you can dye uh, fabrics from rye and tobacco to silk, and gives you a pink color. Uh, then isolate uh, this pink uh, molecule uh, using PLC as well as silicon polymer and subject the, the crude extract using uh, Fourier transform spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy, as well as uh, separate them and identify the mass using LCMS uh, spectrometry. And what we have found is a unique signature for a post for the giant structure. This for the giant structure is uh, a tricycling molecule with a lipid side chain, mainly uh, with this uh, uh, amino uh, NH uh, type of molecule with an ether side chain as well. So although this, the molecule we have is uh, should I add, quite small, uh, we were not able to do a tandem mass spec where in your fragmenting the entire molecule, but at least looking into this, we are proposing a family of protegyne pigments, which if we look into the genome of known uh, or deposited uh, pseudo-alteromonas uh, rubra, we can see a good correspondence with established biosynthetic gene cluster with another red pigmented uh, bacterium, Aceratia uh, marcescens. And this conservation is quite present across the board for all the positive genomes of uh, pseudo-alteromonas rubra with a homology of at least 70%. So that's fairly uh, high uh, and may support the actual ability of our isolate to produce protegiasin uh, or protegiasin. To, to actually uh, corroborate such claims, we perform further LCMS spectrometry and we have identified at least three analogs of this for the giant pigments, a hexyl or a six carbon chain uh, methyl uh, moiety. You have the heptyl or a seven carbon chain phthalate uh, for the giant, and an actual cyclase, where in this 
us uh, tail, uh, this aliphatic chain created this uh, uh, methyl uh, hexane uh, moiety. So we're quite happy that uh, we were able to identify the molecule as well as uh, the putative biosynthetic gene cluster. But how does this fit with escapade and the antimicrobial resistance story? Well, uh, last year, the, the year that we published our work, a group in Indonesia actually isolated a similar strain, uh, Sudoro, Pseudo-Alteromonas rubra, uh, that produced uh, this protegiant analogs. And it was shown actually to actually uh, to kill uh, Staph aureus, uh, Salmonella type, and E. coli. So although our initial plan to look for the pigments um, deviated, uh, we still have the potential of maybe looking at our heptyl or hexyl analog and whether that is uh, effective in also killing stop or reduce or inhibiting at least uh, this SFK sets of uh, pathogens. Uh, as for the other isolates, uh, the availability of the genomes required time to actually isolate the pigments. Uh, we, at the moment, have data on our HPLC traces. And based on the genome, we are proposing certain molecules like this carotenoid, zeaxanthin, isorinaric, that, of course, will require those uh, analytical chemistry tools. The last few slides that I'll be showing you will essentially be a, a summary uh, kind of completing slide. Uh, so for this talk, I have shown you three projects uh, uh, exploring three different environments uh, in two different countries. And uh, with the current pandemic, there's a lot of uh, virtual communication and uh, I guess management for this type of work. Uh, first one, I have shown you how genomics uh, was utilized as a tool to reclassify uh, bacillus amylolipidations to bacillus. Uh, we have data to show to correlate gene clusters with the biosurfactant and, and just in biosynthesis and using bioactivity guided metabolomics to identify four analogs. In the future, we're hoping that uh, we can also look into the possibility of uh, either a homologous or a heterologous type of probiotic to actually look into its MRSA activity. The second project. Uh, We're able to show uh, and reveal a novel species of Streptomyces from uh, Alpai, from the Leon volcano, and the extracts of which, uh, which we are also uh, pursuing, uh, show potential antibacterial and anti cancer properties. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to have the rights to actually propose for its name, unless, you know, in this game of uh, genomics, if another species of Streptomyces will be isolated. Let's say another volcano, I don't know, uh, in Pinatubo or in Taal or uh, whatever else, Hibo Hibo, then maybe the name will be different. Uh, we're also interested in eliciting the actual molecule that uh, uh, shows anti cancer uh, potential. And last but not the least, uh, we have shown uh, for the first time probing uh, four species of uh, marine bacteria from Venom rice first in the country and identify uh, potential uh, low site to probe in the future uh, for the pigment biosynthesis. Uh, the bio, the protegiant family of pigments yeah. can be utilized as a guide and we can also elucidate and correlate whether uh, these pigments can be utilized for the SKPA type of work. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention and for listening to my talk. Um, I guess the last sort of message I would like to share is that the time is now to be a responsible antibiotic producer. Thank you. All right, so that was truly comprehensive and enlightening talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Sana. So it's really alarming that um, in less than 30 years, there might be 10 million um, antibiotic resistant death, resistance deaths. So that is why, as what Dr. Sander indicated, there is really a need um, to work on this global problem. So we'll learn a lot from the points of the project.
isolation on extreme environments. So microorganisms in the soil and in, and in the ocean is really dominant in our planet. So they play an important role in the regulation of major geochemical cycles as well as a potential and potentially contribute on the discovery of genomic driven natural products. So once again, thank you, Dr. Sanas. So if you have any questions or clarifications to our speaker, you may reserve them in your jersey open forum or you may keep your questions coming in the chat box so that our working community could summarize <coughs> them and your needs and actions for proper acknowledgement. So to proceed with it, our third and last speaker for today is Dr. Raymond S. Regalia. He is currently an, assist an assistant professor at the College of Science at Bicol University. He is also the study leader, the study leader of various academic research projects, such as meso- and microplastic multivans as potential vectors of antimicrobial resistant vibrio species from February 2020 to the present, and the validation of the genotypic characteristics of selected yield varieties using SSR markers yield nicer program from August 2021 to the present. He graduated his Doctor of Philosophy in Biotechnology at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia in 2016 and a recipient of the Australian Leadership Awards for PhD scholarship. He earned his Master's degree in Microbiology at the University of the Philippines, Illinois in 2007 and his Bachelor's degree in Biology, major in Microbiology at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Aside from his experience in the academy as a professor, he has held several positions in the academy in the field of research, being the science research specialist at the Marine Science Institute of UP Diliman and as a university research associate at the Department of Medical Microbiology, College of Public Health, UP Manila. He also has experience in the industry as a laboratory analyst of microbiology at Food Farm Agriculture Corporation and Society General. Surveillance SDS Incorporated. He also served as a resource speaker and facilitator in several forums and conferences in the local and national setting. He is also a member of the following professional organizations the Philippine Society for Microbiology Incorporated, the Philippine Society for Lactic Acid Bacteria, and the Philippine Society of Chemistry and Molecular Biology. So, talk on the topic or the stream lifestyle decision making in bacteria. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a virtual round of applause to our esteemed speaker, Dr. Raymond S. Regalia. Start 
by uh, oh, by showing you uh, microbial communities in the environment. And uh, I actually delivered minimized some of these um, some of some of the images are actually but um, uh, some of the images I uh, minimized because uh, I show lunch time, the lunch time time, so I don't know what I'm trying to do. But essentially, where white films are, microbes can actually be found. So in here, you can see microbial maps. In uh, uh, this one is in Kuta, Yellowstone National Park. You can see here a slimy stream biofilms. You can see here biofilms from uh, the roots of plants, uh, stromatolites, which is very common in Western Australia, uh, and dinoflagellate being colonized by uh, uh, marine bacteria, of course, uh, uh, black, uh, and we have here in the, uh, industrial biofilms as well, and then you can see here the uh, uh, lung location colonized Certain uh, microbes, which is known as Echinosa strain B01, which causes systemic microbiosis, and then I mentioned before, Sir Albert, and you see here a wood biofilm. So uh, things things that are really slimy and uh, are made up of uh, microorganisms. Right here. And if you and if you a sample and look look at it under the microscope, you can actually see. Cells. So these, these are false color images. You can see the filament cells and some cells here that are light. And then what you what what you see here are cells embedded in the microbe matrix, which is made up of uh, extracellular polymeric substances or extracellular polysaccharides. Uh, another uh, image to show the uh, connectivity of uh, cells within the biofilm. And of course, this one is a nice image. Uh, it shows here uh, pores or channels which allows fluid to pass through and feed the biofilm. And this one uh, is a uh, scanning image or scanning electron microwave image of the larger view of the cells. So, individual cells here in this that uh, is embedded in a matrix of uh, polysaccharides. So, um, why do uh, microorganisms? Essentially, is because uh, they want to protect themselves from environmental stresses, um, ultraviolet rays, uh, ultraviolet uh, uh, rays, uh, temperature, pH, nutrient loss, and hence starvation and of course uh, free radicals. And definitely, form biofilms because they want to protect themselves from. Uh, protozoa increasing. So that would include a number of microorganisms which we know that would eat uh, bacteria. So we are the, at the next trophic levels and uh, uh, cells would definitely want to protect uh, themselves from the increasing pressure. So from protozoa in natural environments and of course from macrophages in uh, the human body. And of course not to mention uh, attack by bacteriophages. Uh, so, the, the inspiration to learn more about microbiology biology came from my previous work at the Marine Science Institute, where I worked on a disease of the sea, uh, known as Campophytes. And uh, this is characterized, the disease is characterized by uh, whitening and salt. So, uh, for farmers, this 